Hi, it's Dwyer, GamblersAdvisory.com, DwyerBoxingNews.com, on Roku, Dwyer Boxing and Sports News. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, one of the best things about boxing, the absolute best, is that we all have our own private lists of the best fighters we know of. Right now, Floyd Mayweather, a great fighter, has given his list of boxing's very best. Right, according to Floyd, his top five lists, and we'll start from number one, as he did, is Floyd Mayweather, number one. Number two is Roberto Duran. Number three is Pernell Whitaker. Number four is Julio Cesar Chavez. Number five is Muhammad Ali. Now, let me say this. Um, you know, who are any of us to question anyone's personal list? Right? Boxing's like baseball. The stuff we're looking at, you know, is really personal to us. Right? It really reflects the things we view as valuable in the sport, right? And so we don't have to agree on a top five. One of the beautiful things about boxing, just like it is in baseball or basketball, is you can go to the local pub and then, you know, make your case. And let me say this. Your case is going to change over time based on information that you learn about. For example, I can tell younger people here online, in the 70s, there was a big scandal, big scandal, over the thriller in Manila. It was huge. Understand the way the Ali Fraser trilogy ends. The thriller in Manila hangs in the balance. Ali looks, you know, spent. Fraser looks spent. Eddie Futch in the corner makes the decision not to have his fighter in a very close fight answer the bell for the 15th round right just picture a 12 round fight with three more rounds of exhaustion then just think about a murderous pace at heavy weight right well understand at the time people were outraged right they thought gee how could Eddie Fudge do this to his fighter Right? Folklore developed over the fight. People thought, you know what? Ali clearly loses the first fight. The second fight, Ali's illegally grabbing Joe Fraser. Right? That was another issue for the third fight. Right? You had people who said, hey, how come Carlos Padilla didn't allow Ali to grab Fraser when Fraser got inside? Right? Everyone thought their fighter won the fight. And I'm telling you, with Ali and Fraser, you know, each fighter had huge camps, right? The Fraser people thought Fraser got this fight wrongfully taken from him. Well, over time, of course, because the fight was in the mid-70s, over time, we came to learn from very good sources. And you only hear this from these sources years later, that Joe Fraser, according to Joe Fraser, was blind in the eye that wasn't closed before that 15th round, right? Eddie Futch knew Fraser was blind in the open eye. It was his good eye that got closed, right? Fraser later admitted he couldn't see. Look at the 14th round again. You're going to see Fraser swinging and missing, and you think, okay, well, maybe he's tired. You know, actually, maybe he's blind in that last round, right? So in the mid-70s, it wasn't clear. You might have thought, hey, you know, that, that throw in the middle could have gone either way. It's years later that you realize, you know what? Ali won that fight, right? There's another, by the way, bit of folklore from that fight. People claim Ali was ready to cut off the gloves, right, before the 15th round. My point to you, though, is information you learn after the fact is going to color 
your opinion of fights. Your own top five list is going to change over time. Let me give you a more recent example. Saw a great fight. It's one of the first fights I did here online. Miguel Cotto, then unbeaten against Antonio Margarito. It was a great fight. Eventually, Cotto looked broken. Cotto's face looks puffy and grotesque. I've never seen Cotto's face look like that at any other time. Right? Margarito wins the fight. Later, Margarito is busted with tainted gloves before his fight with Shane Mosley. Right? You know, rightly or wrongly, that casts doubt on the Cotto Margarito fight. Then you revisit Miguel Cotto and you say, well, whoa, wait a moment. Did Cotto really lose that fight? Right? Cotto's profile over time might change based on your own answer to that question. Right? Then, of course, you have fights that involve weight issues. Darnell Boone beats Adonis Stevenson. For the rematch, they're supposed to fight at a certain weight. They changed the weight on Darnell Boone at the last minute. Darnell Boone facing a much bigger Adonis Stevenson, a guy he didn't face the first time, gets drilled. Right? You even have thrown fights. We now have old timers like Jake LaMotta coming forward and saying, you know what? That fight I fought with this guy, I threw it to get a title shot. Right now, that works two ways. The guy who beat him, you know, a lot of people are going to say, well, you know, that guy wasn't as good as I thought. Then the folks who say, yeah, you know, I love Jake LaMotta, but man, did he look bad in that fight? Right? They're going to reconsider and say, well, you know what? Jake threw that fight. That wasn't really Jake in the ring. Right? Then, of course, you have another crowd that says, thrown fight? You gotta be kidding. That's an automatic disqualifier. Right? Let me say this, too. We're in an analytics age. Metrics in sports change. I'm telling you, when I was a kid, we looked at batting average in baseball. Right? Guy had a 300 batting average. You thought, oh, this guy is balling. Right? The newer generation is savvier than we were. They look at things like on base percentage, OPS. You go back and you then reclassify guys from the past through the current prism, and they look different. Right? They do. Also, understand as we look at fighters, right? Keeping in mind that. Sugar Ray Robinson, a 160-pound fighter, decides, hey, I want another belt. He doesn't have a 168-pound division to play with. He doesn't. Right? He has to jump to 175 pounds against the light heavyweight champ. And he's winning that fight before he and the referee have to stop that fight because of heat exhaustion. Right? They replace the ref in the middle of the fight because he's heat exhaustion. Then they replace Ray Robinson, right? He loses the fight. He can't continue in a fight in which he's winning on the scorecards. How would Ray Robinson's career have been different if he were able to say, hey, you know what? Let me fight at 168. Right? Think about Hank Armstrong. We talk about weight classes and all this other stuff. Understand how arbitrary that is. In Henry Armstrong's day, he only had eight weight classes. Eight. This guy was simultaneously the champ of three of them. Today, you're hearing about guys with five and six weight class belts and stuff like that. And then you realize, whoa, wait a moment. They split up the weight classes, didn't they? Right? So as new information comes in, as you start to look at the weights and you realize, whoa, wait a moment, you know, Ray Robinson was outweighed by a lot of pounds, a lot of pounds in his fight. 
you know, against Jake LaMotta. When you realize that Rocky Marciano enters the ring against Joe Lewis, outweighed by dozens of pounds, and then proceeds to knock Joe Lewis through the ropes. And when you realize that Marciano fought a lot of his fights at what we would now consider to be the cruiserweight division, and yet he's knocking out guys, right? The world changes. Right? All of our lists are going to evolve as we get more and more information. I'll say this. At the time, I thought Salvador Sanchez was one of the best fighters I'd ever seen. Now we have YouTube. Now I get to just click on a video and I get to see the fights. And keep in mind, back then, the world was different. Right? He would fight some guy. You wouldn't see the fight live on TV. You had to wait a couple of weeks for it to come on things like Wide World of Sports, right? Understand, we didn't have a lot of cable stations then. You had just a few networks. Also, back then, understand in the 70s, a lot of us didn't have DVRs or VCRs, right? You saw the fight once. So I remember I saw, like the person vacuuming out here, I saw... Ray Leonard against Thomas the Hitman Hearns, right, once. I'm telling you, that's one of the greatest fights I've ever seen in my life. To see the Hitman hurt late in that fight, that was jaw-dropping. And understand, we didn't have the capability then to just hit rewind or hit pause, right, to then, you know, think about it before we continued the action. Back then... If you left to use the bathroom and you came back and your guy got stopped, you missed it. So, let's talk about the guys Floyd uh, picked. I believe all five guys. A strong argument can be made that all five are great fighters. Right? Let me say this about Roberto Duran, who he names as number two. Understand that Mayweather is a great defensive fighter. He's a great defensive fighter. Understand that Roberto Duran was a master at defense. Right? You didn't see Duran getting battered in fights. He could get on your chest and he would be leaning and blocking your shots in such a way that you couldn't hit him. Right? There are very few Duran fights where his face is marked up. He's a great defensive fighter. Let me also say this too. Understand that by the time most of us saw Duran fighting the likes of Ray Leonard and Marvin Hagler, right? Understand that Duran was well out of his prime weight. Roberto Duran is one of the best lightweights in history, right? His signature is all over the 135 pound division. So understand when you see Duran beat Ray Leonard, outside of lightweight that's not even Duran's domain I'll even go further the Duran Marvin Hagler fight understand Hagler is a dominant I mean dominant middleweight champion he fights Roberto Duran during his heyday Duran gives him one of his toughest fights ever Understand Duran, who ruled the roost at 135, is in the ring with Marvin Hagler at 160, a dominant champ. And he goes 15 rounds against Marvin Hagler. Right? That's the level of defense and savvy and slickness Roberto Duran had. Understand, Thomas Hearns doesn't make it the distance with Hagler. John the Beast Mugabe doesn't make it the distance with Hagler. Let me say this too. Ray Leonard moved a lot against Hagler. Could you imagine a guy not moving as much as Ray Leonard did hanging around the outskirts of the pocket against Marvin Hagler? Think about it. And actually going the distance against Hagler. Hagler, by his own admission, this is the legendary fight where Hagler loses the first few rounds comes to his corner for advice 
and his corner makes a suggestion to him about faking and looping punches that actually delivers the fight for him. Understand how good Roberto Duran was. As you look at films of Duran against guys like Aran Barkley and Marvin Hagler, just imagine the terror he was at lightweight, total terror. Let's talk about Pernell Whitaker. Of course, Whitaker, the gold standard of defense, is going to be on a list of Floyd Mayweather's because Mayweather is a great defensive fighter himself, right? Mayweather values defense. Understand, Pernell Whitaker was spectacular. Longtime viewers here online know I feel Pernell Whitaker just on defense alone beats Oscar De La Hoya when they fought, right? Pernell Whitaker, to me, clearly beats Julio Cesar Chavez when they fought. I'm telling you, I was in Mexico. I went to Mexico to watch that fight. The fight took place in San Antonio. And I'm telling you, I was one of the few black guys in a heavily Mexican place watching this fight, right? This is the old days where you're in, in a, you know, in a theater type setup to watch the fight. And I'm telling you, after the fight, Latinos I did not know came up to me and said, lo siento, lo siento, right? I am sorry, I am sorry. They thought Pernell Whitaker had beaten Julio Cesar Chavez, right? Let me also say the obvious. Fighters are in their prime for only a set period of time, right? You also need to look behind the curtain. Certain fighters develop very bad habits, some of them drug habits, later in their career. Right. As Donald Trump likes to say, you can be great, but if you're on alcohol and drugs, you could lose your edge. Right. The world's too competitive. Now, Pernell Whitaker later had some challenges. Right. The Pernell Whitaker who fights guys like Felix Trinidad, he's not prime Pernell Whitaker. Just like if you go out and see Roy Jones fight today. Understand, you're not seeing the same Roy Jones who ruled the roost in the 1990s, who beat Tony, who beat Hopkins, right? Who then goes on and wins the heavyweight championship, right? This is Roy past his expiration date, right? Pernell Whitaker, it's hard to envision someone beating Whitaker legitimately in his prime. Let me say this about Julio Cesar Chavez. As you look at Gennady Golovkin, understand Abel Sanchez's mission, right? He said so in interviews, is to turn Golovkin into Julio Cesar Chavez, right? Understand, if you look at Golovkin and if you look at Chavez, you're going to realize Chavez is the better defensive fighter. Right, Chavez had a lot of head movement. We don't notice it because he's a hunter. Right? He's the guy typically getting the knockout. Right? But you don't realize how smooth and slippery the guy is on the way in. Roger Mayweather did. Right? Roger Mayweather claims that he hit Chavez Jr., <laughs> excuse me, Chavez Sr. with the kitchen sink. And Chavez went nowhere. He has one of the best chins in history. Right? He went nowhere. Now, like Purnell, Chavez had some substance abuse issues. You can't look at Chavez at the end of his career and think you're seeing prime Chavez. Right? You need to go back to when Chavez is fighting Roger Mayweather. Right? Let me say this, too, about Ali. And I'm going to mention another guy who Floyd mentions. Right now, Floyd points out that Ali lost to Leon Spinks, who only had seven fights. And he's 100% correct. Understand how embarrassing that fight was. Ali was the reigning heavyweight champion at the time. He's the one who picked Leon Spinks. Think about that. Right? Well... Understand, though, that the Ali who fought Leon Spinks, and by the way, I saw that fight live. It wasn't pay-per-view. 
It was on network television. I believe it was on CBS. Welcome to a different era. In fact, with the PBC, maybe that era is back now. But just understand that when you talk about Ali, please, let's talk about his prime. Let's not talk about the portion of his career where he's fighting Leon Spinks, right? Or Larry Holmes. That's like me talking about Roy Jones today. Now, let me say this, and I don't say it lightly, and I'll agree, Ali has issues, right? Ali didn't really go to the body, in my opinion. Uh, very interesting Ali fight is Ali against Jimmy Young. Ali wasn't a switch. He couldn't take control from the opening bell, right? He, he begs Jimmy Young to take the lead, begs him to take the lead in that fight. Very revealing fight. But understand, Prime Ali, I would argue, just like Prime Duran is the lightweight division, right? When he's hands of stone, Prime Ali is actually the Ali who is taking out Cleveland Williams, right? That's Prime Ali, Zora Fali, Floyd Patterson, Sonny Liston, right? Mid-60s Ali. I'll just say this. I've watched the heavyweight division an awfully long time. Ali's a paradigm shift. The Ali who fights Cleveland Williams, to me, there, with all due respect to my dad, a big Joe Lewis fan, there's simply no way, no way at all, that a Joe Lewis would be able to cope with that heavyweight. Right there, you know, there's no way that a Lennox Lewis would be able to cope with that heavyweight. Right? I, you know, robotic Vladimir Klitschko, please, against Fluid Ali, the one who takes out Cleveland Williams in the 60s, because Ali's too fluid. Right? He floated like a butterfly in his words. Right? His legs were simply too good. His hand speed was dazzling. Right? Understand the Ali who makes it to the 70s, right? Who comes back after the political turmoil Floyd talks about. He's a different fighter. In other words, the Ali who fights Joe Fraser three times, right? Let me tell you, a very good friend of mine <laughs> believes Joe Fraser should have won all three of those fights, right? Who fights Ken Norton three times. You heard Floyd make the case that Ken Norton beats Ali. In all of those fights right and I'm telling you he's not alone in thinking that right that Ali to me loses badly the Ali who beats Foreman in the jungle right the rumble in the jungle loses badly to the Ali who beats Cleveland Williams right the people who talk about the greatness of Ali remember the 1960s they remember this guy punishing Ernie Terrell and saying, what's my name? And putting on a display that really few heavyweights ever can match. Let's just objectively think about it. The best legs you've ever seen in the heavyweight division belong to who? Let me add to that. The best hand speed you've seen in the heavyweight division belongs to who? Understand, if you're mentioning the same fighter, that's a wow. For me, the best legs, the best hand speed, that's Ali. What I want people to do, too, is to think size, right? Look at him against Sonny Liston. When they come together at the beginning of the first round, understand Ali is physically bigger than Sonny Liston. Right? He's physically bigger than Sonny Liston. Let's talk about skills, too. Right? We talk about fighters being able to fight backing up and stuff like that. 
the Ali of the 1960s against Liston. I understand we call it a phantom punch. Okay, fine. Ali's backing up. He's throwing leather. Combination puncher. Right? There's certain fighters who come along where the guy just looks different. You're watching the guy and you're saying, wow, this guy just looks different. Ali was one of those guys. I would say in the 1990s, I was looking at Roy Jones Jr. and I, you know, it was just stunning. The guy just seemed to be so fast. That left hook, if you blinked your eye, you missed the left hook. Jones was so fast. You didn't even know, and I'm serious about this. Here is Roy Jones fighting Tony Hopkins. You didn't even know whether Roy Jones could take a punch until the Tarver fight. You didn't know. Roy Jones dominates Montel Griffin. Hits Griffin while he's on the canvas. That's his first loss. That's how, that's how it felt with Ali. Forget the protest. Forget the protest. Forget the 70s. And understand, during that era, Ali beats Foreman, right? Fraser quits on his stool in the Thriller in Manila, right? Ali is in there with Ken Norton, and let's say he's not getting knocked out, right? If you forget the 70s, Ali beats Bob Foster, Hall of Famer, light heavyweight great. And if you just focus on the 60s, and I understand the critics will say, Dwyer, what about the Sonny Banks fight? What about the Henry Cooper fight? Right? But if you just focus on the 60s, I would argue there isn't a heavyweight with Ali's footwork or Ali's hand speed or Ali's ability to hit you, know, hit you with a jab while moving and to operate coming forward and backing up. Understand he's an underdog against Sonny Lister. He hardly throws a punch in the first round of the first Liston fight. Hardly throws a punch. He dominates that round based on movement. Well, let me also plug right now, and I'm not saying he's a top five fighter ever, but I believe certain fighters, for whatever reason, slip through the cracks of history. Let me also plug Kenny Norton. You heard Floyd say that there's some who believe Norton beats Ali all three times, right? Now, Norton had his share of car crashes, the George Foreman fight. By the way, if you're thinking about George Foreman, please look at his fight against Kenny Norton. <laughs> okay, that's even, put it this way, that's as dramatic as George Foreman against Joe Frazier, right? Kenny Norton gets blown out by George Foreman. He gets blown out by Ernie Shavers, another guy who has slipped through the cracks. But understand that Kenny Norton used to train with Joe Frazier. And understand Joe Frazier just flatly refused to fight Kenny in a real fight. Just flatly refused. He knew what he was dealing with. Right? Let me say this, too. Apart from fighting Ali in some spirited matchups, right? He breaks Ali's jaw the first time. Right? Breaks his jaw. The Yankee Stadium fight, oh, that's close. Right? Understand Kenny Norton against Larry Holmes is one of the best fights I've ever seen. Understand the last round of that fight is a must-see. If you're watching this video, I hope you YouTube that fight and watch the last round. Right? Now, I would argue after that fight, Kenny Norton is no longer Kenny Norton. I know he gets blown out by Jerry Cooney, another name you need to remember. Right? But just to understand, Kenny Norton was a world-class fighter in the 1970s fighting world-class competition. Right? Excellent fighter. I'm actually grateful that Floyd Mayweather mentioned him. Right? So... I tip my hat to Mayweather. I hope more of these boxers. Because they're in the game. They know the game. They study the game. They live the game. I hope more of these boxers come out and tell us who they have on their list. Right? 
you know, Floyd doesn't have to agree with me on guys like Ray Robinson, Ray Leonard, Salvador Sanchez, Mike Tyson. And let's face it, right? Mike's not the same fighter after he gets out of prison. He's, he's just not, right? But, you know, as we look at fighters, let's focus on their primes. Let's focus on how dominant they were, right? Let's have the discussion with the understanding that as we look at new films, as we find out new facts, fighter blind in one eye, one guy may have been doctoring his gloves, right? Um, Foreman believed in one of his big fights, you can Google this, that the referee was on the take, right? Ali believed, as did Angelo Dundee, that in one of their big fights, the other guy, you know, had liniment on his gloves, right? As we find out this information and stuff like that, yeah, some of us are going to have different lists. Some of us are going to say, you know what, I'm not convinced that Miguel Cotto lost that fight, right? You know, keep in mind, too, now we're in the computer age. Now you can punch in judges on sites like BoxRec.com and see their cards from fights. So now you can actually go back and say, whoa, you know what? The scoring here for this fight seems off to me. Keep in mind, these days you actually have things we didn't have in the 70s, right? The ability to rewind films on your time, on demand, and rewatch rounds. Ask yourself big questions, right? Pay attention to weights. Pay attention to whatever advantages a fighter might have, right? Well, anyway, I like Floyd's list. I'll just say guys like Roberto Duran and Pernell Whitaker are far better than advertised. Let me say, too, that history is odd, right? A fight takes place and you don't realize the significance at the time. We did at the time for Pernell Whitaker, Julio Cesar Chavez, right? But just understand how big that fight was. Floyd Mayweather's third best fighter in history fought Floyd Mayweather's fourth best fighter in history. They actually met in the ring. I encourage you to take a look at that fight. That's high-level boxing. Anyway, that's how I see it. Let me hear from you. Also, let me just give another plug for Salvador Sanchez. Little known fact in history, he was uh, Roy Jones, Roy Jones's favorite fighter or one of his favorite fighters growing up. That's how dominant Salvador Sanchez was. Complete fighter. I understand there are those of you who are going to say, look, he died too young. We don't know what he would have become. I would just encourage you to count the number of fights he had. Look at him against Danny Little Red Lopez, right, who was the champion. That's a deconstruction, folks. Look at him against Wilfredo Gomez, right? Look at Gomez's KO percentage. Look at how calm Sanchez is when he backs up against the ropes. Look at him against Azuma Nelson, another fight. Right? Understand, Azuma Nelson went on to a great career and stuff like that. At the end of his career, he was giving an interview and they, you know, asked him about the best fighters he ever faced. And in that interview, he just simply referred to the great Salvador Sanchez. That's how he referred to Sanchez. Right? Um, Nelson understood he had been in the ring with greatness. I believe Floyd's list would have been a little bit more different if Sanchez's car hadn't gotten in the accident. It did. Anyway, that's how I see it. Let me hear from you. Leave your comments for me here online. Drop your list here. I know I'm going to be seeing, let me guess, the Sugar Rays, right? Joe Lewis, Rocky Marciano. Let me say this about Marciano. Uh, Marvin Hagler, and understand, Hagler is from Marciano's part of the world, Massachusetts, 
like understand if if you're into the Massachusetts boxing scene, two of the names on Massachusetts's Mount Rushmore are Marciano and Hagler, right? So not surprisingly, Hagler says Marciano's record, his 49 and 0, is more impressive than Floyd's record because Marciano's doing it at heavyweight. Now, when I was growing up, I always heard, always heard, that Marciano didn't fight anyone of substance. How could that be said? Right? Understand, Marciano himself is really a cruiserweight. And you're telling me he hops in the ring <laughs> against, against Archie Moore. Right? Against, uh, man, his, his name is uh, escaping me. The guy, Ezra Charles, right? He fights Ezra Charles twice, right? Understand, he fights Joe Lewis, knocks Lewis between the ropes. That's before he becomes champ. When you look at his resume, guys like Rex Lane, understand, Marciano's the underdog in many of these fights. The guy who some people believe, Lou Duva believes, beat him, Roland Lestarza, understand Marciano gives him a rematch. I would make the argument to you that Ezra Charles is one of the best fighters in history, that Archie Moore is one of the best fighters in history, that Joe Lewis is one of the best fighters in history. And that's who Rocky Marciano fought. Marciano's record against them was 4-0. I'll agree Joe Lewis had already lost to Ezra Charles. Right? I'll agree another criticism of Joe Lewis would have gotten me kicked out of my house as a kid. Is Joe Lewis, while he was fighting a bum of the month club, didn't fight a lot of African American fighters. Did he fight any until he runs in a Jersey Joe Walcott who, let's face it, beats him and then gets robbed of the decision. Then he goes on to lose to Ezra Charles, right? But I will say this. Think about it, right? Lewis was a great fighter. I know the Lewis people will say, hey, Joe in his prime, power puncher, short puncher, accurate puncher, right? All of that is true, right? Joe Lewis is certainly one of the best fighters in history. And just understand, Marciano did fight and beat him, right? So... Let's go back through history. Let's figure it all out, right? With the understanding that boxing evolves over time and even our lists are going to evolve based on the information we have, right? I still say Charlie Burley was a great fighter. Charlie Burley never held a title. Today, we can actually go back and look at his resume, right? Back then in the 50s, People didn't really have the access to the information that we have today, right? Sam Langford, great fighter, same thing, excluded from a title, right? Maybe our lists need to actually include guys who never had the opportunity to fight for a title. Also understand, too, fights will change based on history. Lennox Lewis fights Vitaly Klitschko. The fight would be a footnote except for the fact that Vitaly Klitschko then goes on to be one of the dominant heavyweight champions in history. Understand, as you look at Lennox Lewis's body of work, fights that we thought were more meaningful at the time, Lewis against the Vander Holyfield, for example. Right now, pale in comparison, in my opinion, to the Lewis-Vitaly Klitschko fight. Right? That's the way it is in history. Mike McCallum did beat Julian Jackson. Right? It's like Timothy Bradley did beat Miguel Vasquez. Right? I mean, you know, just think it through. Uh, anyway, that's how I see it. Let me hear from you. I'll say this, too. The films you see online of Sugar Ray Robinson at middleweight understand his best weight may have been welterweight. There aren't as many tapes of that. So as you see him running into Gene Fulmer, right, great fighter, as you see him running into Gene Fulmer, just understand this is Ray Robinson after he had retired the first time from the sport. Then he's back, 
and he's fighting in a weight class where he wasn't as dominant as he was when he was at Welter. Anyway, let's continue the dialogue. I hope you do so in the comment section to this video. Thanks for stopping by.